My, my topic uh, is on uh, international monetary and financial system, current features and perspective. I will present some uh, my research, some uh, works that I have already published, but also my uh, work in progress. Uh, and so it will be very nice to discuss w with you. Um, uh, some uh, starting ideas. Um, the current international monetary financial system is um, corresponds to a specific phase of capitalism, the finance-led capitalism, and I, I will highlight the similarities and also difference uh, in comparison with the previous international monetary financial system. And uh, my understanding uh, of the current dynamics and um, of the perspectives is based on uh, historical evidence, but also a specific uh, theoretical approach. Uh, then, um, as I think not all, all of you know na, my, my uh, approach, my research, I would like to, to present. Um, I call uh, this approach Keynesian, is structuralist, uh, the approach na, on this, this issue, uh, because it's based on Keynes' writings on the international monetary system, uh, mainly in the Treats of Money, the last chapter. Uh, it's not working? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's easier. Uh, now it's better? Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, also, uh, Keynes' writings in the Bretton Woods Conference. Uh, in my university, in Unicamp, since the 1980s, there are some, a group of prof professors is working on uh, the, the Keynes uh, approach on the international monetary system. And so I'm part of this group. Uh, but I mainly uh, in my PhD thesis, I combine the Keynes approach with the Latin American structuralism uh, that the founding father was uh, Raul Prebisch, but uh, more recently uh, Ocampo has also been uh, working on linking uh, the structuralism, uh, uh, use the structuralism to think about the uh, international monetary financial system. Uh, so the concept, uh, key concept of this approach is uh, that the uh, world economy is a hierarchical and uh, divide in two poles, uh, the center and the per periphery. And this uh, economy is featured uh, by uh, persistent structural asymmetries. And what I, I, have, I, I do, I update this structuralist approach uh, of international asymmetries uh, to the current uh, international environment. Uh, but besides uh, this economic literature this, and the economic field, uh, I also use some, um, the approach of international political economy, mainly uh, Susan Strange, Eric Hillener, and uh, Benjamin Cohen, uh, because I think to understand the uh, international monetary system and think about what will happen in the future, uh, we need to consider the power relations among the states and the, the relations among states and markets that is the main subject of this uh, literature. Um, so firstly, I will present the current features and after uh, talk about perspectives. Um, uh, the well-known uh, features of the system uh, is that after uh, the Bretton Woods breakdown is the flexible exchange rates, the high capital mobility, and the fiduciary uh, US dollar as key currency. And the uh, interplay of these three uh, um, pillars uh, result in the predominance of a speculative logic in a, a con contest of high uncertainty that uh, result in, uh, as the post keynesian literature has emphasized in uh, uh, these and mainly John Harvey, you know, the, the high volatility of capital flows, exchange rates, asset markets, and the high degree of contagion uh, among uh, uh, the the crisis, the a crisis that happened uh, in one country and spread all over the world, and so you, you well-known features. Uh, but uh, a third, uh, a fourth feature linked with the 
uh, fiduciary dollar role as key, key currency is what uh, we call uh, the currency hierarchy. And the currency hierarchy uh, result in a monetary asymmetry. Um, why? This is uh, based, the idea of the currency hierarchy is uh, refers to the hierarchical feature uh, of an uh, international monetary system uh, based, anchored in a key currency. So all the international monetary system that has <laughs> already existed, the pound Stern and Bretton Woods, wa was based in a key, key currency. So this is a common feature. Uh, and why this is a problem? Why this result in a monetary, what, what I call a monetary asymmetry? Uh, would like to explain more this, but uh, a key idea is that the Keynes proposal on Bretton Woods, the aim was exactly to eliminate this uh, hierarchy and then this uh, asymmetry. And there uh, is one way, I think the, the easiest, easiest way and, uh, to explain uh, this, and was also uh, what is in the mind of Keynes uh, when uh, he, uh, he proposed the, the bunker, uh, is uh, an analogy uh, of the international monetary system with the national monetary uh, system. So, uh, as you know, a key idea this, uh, is what the Puskinism called the hierarchy of money na at the national level. Uh, so the highest liquid premium, uh, the state money is, uh, uh, has the highest liquid premium and uh, is only the state with the state money that could pay its debt, its debts with its all IOU. And uh, it, we, when two banks are in the interbank market, the settlement of these uh, the transactions is made with the uh, state money. Uh, but when we look at the dynamics, the fi this feature, this currency hierarchy of the international monetary system, uh, why this uh, asymmetry com come up? Uh, that is also refers as the uh, exorbitant privilege of the issuer of the key currency. Because the issuer of key cur the key currency could pay its debt with its own currency, so with its own IOU. So this uh, is uh, the, co the cause, the main cause of the asymmetry uh, between the issuer of the key currency, currently the United States, and the other uh, currencies. So this is wha what Keynes emphasized. So this uh, asymmetry. But what we uh, also work on and uh, uh, currently many students are detailing this uh, uh, other level of asymmetry, that is the asymmetry uh, between central currencies and peripheral currencies. So uh, it's in mainly this level that we uh, use the structuralist uh, approach. So to understand uh, these uh, two levels of asymmetry, uh, uh, the first one, the key currency and the other ones, and also uh, between the central and the peripheral uh, currencies. And so at the international level, we have also the uh, asymmetry of liquidity premiums. Uh, the highest liquidity premium, uh, uh, the Key currency has the highest liquidity premium, and we have a graduation. Uh, the lowest the currency is at the currency hierarchy, the lowest the liquidity premium. Uh, uh, how we uh, de depicted this profile of the currency hierarchy? Uh, in a paper uh, co author with uh, Bruno De Conti, that uh, unfortunately is not here because he pr is presenting all the section. Uh, we uh, construct many indicators of the use of the currencies at the international level, uh, based on mainly database. Is, this is not easy to do because we, have on, we don't uh, find one database on, on all these uh, six uh, morning functions or uh, cu currency roles at the international level. Uh, this classification of currencies uh, was originally proposed by uh, Benjamin Cohen, but is 
gen is used uh, by mainstream economies and uh, is, is like a uh, uh, standard classification. Uh, and the idea uh, is that uh, uh, to measure the degree of currency internationalization. So this concept of currency internationalization is a key concept of the literature of international political uh, economy. And uh, the idea is that at the international uh, level is important to uh, consider the two, uh, the two levels <laughs> of uh, usage of our currency, the private and the public, uh, in the three functions of money. So we have six, six functions. Uh, I, um, I will present one uh, indicator as representative, and after uh, I will present others. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, what is Im important, I think, to highlight, that the degree of currency internationalization is only a proxy of the position of a currency in the currency hierarchy. Uh, and here I'm uh, using, I'm based on the works of Anina Kaltenburn from, from Leeds, and the Bianca Orsi uh, that uh, uh, emphasize the difference uh, between the position in the currency hierarchy and the type of currency hierarchy. And uh, because of that, sometimes an indicator, so I will show you the Mexican peso has a, a higher degree of currency internationalization in comparison uh, from the Brazilian real. But this the, uh, doesn't mean that the Mexican peso is a currency accepted as at the international level uh, as a story of value. No, but his, his trading, uh, his degree of currency internationalization is related with a short term, uh, the function of short term investment currency. So a, a currency that is uh, bought and sold uh, with the aim of speculative uh, gains. Uh, other uh, function uh, included, highlighted by uh, these authors, is the function of funding currency. Because at uh, the original uh, classification of coin, coin uh, he emphasized only the function of unit of account in the uh, trade operations. But in the current system, it, what is most important more important is the function or at uh, the unit of account at the financial transactions. And so in this uh, kind of transactions, the whole of funding currency is very important. And only central currencies has fulfilled the role of funding currencies. Uh, so this is important. Uh, uh, only uh, to present uh, the profile uh, of the currency uh, hierarchy uh, using this uh, indicator that is the indicator of means of payment at the private usage so is a um, foreign exchange uh, market turnover uh, the total is 200 percent but because it's transactions um, between two currencies and this data uh, review uh, brought to light the predominance of the U.S. dollar, and um, it's interesting uh, to to highlight the, that the share of the, the uh, U.S. dollar has uh, increased after the global uh, financial system, uh, after <laughs> global financial crisis. Sorry, and uh, the last, last data is 2016 because this uh, BIS research. Uh, uh, is from uh, two years, uh, so uh, now in September, uh, a new re a new uh, um, date, new data will be uh, uh, launched. And just below the dollar, uh, the the euro, uh, uh, that share has decreased uh, since the crisis, uh, and the other uh, central currencies. So the two most important, the yen and the sterling pound. Uh, I'm only highlighting some no, uh, currencies. Uh, and below Australian dollar and Canadian dollar. Uh, what is interesting, that uh, also interesting, among peripheral currency, we see difference, important difference. 
also uh, the China's uh, Yuan, uh, the renminbi, uh, is the peripheral currencies uh, that has the highest share in uh, the exchange market to turnover. And what is uh, most important is not the, the, the current, the 2016 share of 4.4, but the rate of growth. So the rate of growth since uh, 2007. So after the crisis, what happened? The share of the renminbi uh, has been increasing. The share of the euro decreasing and the share of the dollar uh, increasing. So this is, I think, the uh, important to, to highlight. And the Mexico peso. But me the Mexico peso is what I mentioned. Uh, it's not, uh, its share is more, uh, more, it's more due uh, to, uh, to related to a speculative use of the currency, not uh, really uh, international currency. Uh, and uh, uh, the the other peripheral currency. So we have also difference, but uh, more or less the maximum is 1%. So we, we have this group, uh, India, Russia, uh, South Africa, and Brazilian, uh, is the BRICS without uh, China, uh, and after the other, other currencies. So only to uh, highlight uh, why uh, this pro the current profile of uh, the currency uh, hierarchy. Uh, but now uh, I would like to highlight the difference, the difference of the uh, current system uh, uh, or the two important difference from the previous international um, monetary financial system. So is the fiduciary character of the US dollar. And this is a feature that is not highlighted uh, neither by the mainstream economics, ne neither by the international political economy literature, and from my point of view, is a key feature. Uh, uh, sorry, the only Susan Strange highlighted that. I'm using uh, Susan Strange here, and uh, but uh, uh, Benjamin Cohen, for example, and other more mainstream international political economy. Uh, 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 scholars didn't uh, don't highlight that. So why the fiduciary uh, character is so important? Because uh, it resulted in uh, what uh, Susan String called a super exorbitant privilege. So every uh, issuer of a key currency has an exorbitant privilege, but when the currency is fiduciary, is not convertible in gold, this what happened, uh, the United States currency uh, doesn't face any constraint. Uh, so uh, uh, it could pay everything he wants with issuing US dollar. So this is the, the cause of the exorbitant, super exorbitant privilege uh, in comparison with the convertible dollar and the convertible uh, pound sterling. Uh, so this is important uh, specificity. And the other one is uh, the interplay uh, between the monetary asymmetry and the uh, what I call the financial asymmetry. Uh, what is the financial asymmetry? Uh, it refers to the uh, asymmetrical insertion of peripheral economies uh, in the financial globalization setting. Uh, uh, here I, I, I use, I always use uh, uh, the definition of um, Francois Chesnay of uh, financial globalization. I think it's the, um, I prefer, <laughs> the one I prefer. So uh, the financial globalization r uh, refers to the interpenetration uh, of national uh, monet monetary and financial system uh, and of this um, national monetary financial system with the offshore market. So is the interpenetration between the onshore markets and of this, the onshore ma market with the offshore uh, market. And why uh, this uh, insertion is uh, asymmetrical? Uh, for two uh, reasons. Uh, but uh, uh, before presenting these two reasons, only to uh, uh, present another uh, concept that I use 
is that uh, when uh, they engaged uh, into the financial globalization, the peripheral economies uh, became uh, emergent market economies. So I, I'm, I use the term uh, emerging economies or emerging market economies with uh, this meaning uh, of the peripheral economies that uh, uh, engaged in the economic uh, glo uh, in financial globalization uh, because not every peripheral economy uh, is engaged. Uh, the first uh, uh, dimension of the asymmetry um, refers to the determinants of capital flows. This is nowadays, the uh, three in the IMF, this is every, everyone <laughs> agree on, on this uh, topic that uh, the external factors are the main determinants of uh, capital flows. Uh, in the beginning of the 90s, there w w was a, disc uh, a discussion of these uh, push factors, uh, pull factors, uh, internal factors, external factors, but now uh, is a, uh, there a consensus that are external factors. Um, and so uh, we could uh, say that the center is the global cycle financial maker and the periphery is the global uh, uh, global financial taker. So this is one key reason of the high vulnerability uh, of peripheral economies to the shocks, financial shocks and crisis uh, of these systems. So uh, this vulnerability uh, is related with both the monetary asymmetry and the financial asymmetry. And uh, this figure is, uh, uh, I put here to highlight it, that uh, what uh, happened uh, to show the relationship between the two asymmetries. So the money managers from center economies uh, uh, has uh, assets around the world. So the assets uh, on emerging economies uh, b because they search uh, for speculative gains, but uh, they has liabilities only in the uh, center uh, currencies because only these currencies are used as funding currencies. And the second uh, asymmetry uh, is uh, the marginal insertion of peripheral, uh, ma uh, peripheral economies, the emerging market economies, in the global uh, financial flows. So here, uh, only one indicator, the cross-border equity holdings. And uh, what happened uh, since since 2009, when uh, these economies uh, uh, engaged uh, in the financial globalization. Uh, their share in the total global flows has increased. So uh, we could sh uh, see that uh, in the green uh, uh, circles. So we see that the share increased, but is still marginal. Uh, but the problem is that uh, in comparison with the dimension of this country, financial market, this, the volume uh, of capital flows is not small, it's too high. Uh, and is why, uh, when the, the, is why the boom in bursts of capital flows uh, has a huge impact on peripheral economies, emerging market economies, cap, uh, exchange rates, asset price. And uh, a metaphor used by Henry Howden that uh, this uh, uh, data is from one speech of Howden is a, was, I don't know if currently he still be uh, the chief economist of the uh, Bank of England. Uh, the metaphor, big fish, small pond. So the big fish are, uh, is the capital flows uh, to emerging market economies and the small pond uh, uh, is the financial domestic uh, financial markets. Uh, then in this uh, finance-led capitalism, uh, what happened? The, we still have uh, the productive technological asymmetries highlighted by Previous by the the, old, the the original the scholars of the Latin American structuralists, and uh, at the Bretton Woods period, uh, these uh, sh shocks, the term of trade shocks, linked with these uh, uh, productive technological symmetries, uh, was more important. Uh, but 
in the financial aid capitalism what happened. Uh, we still have these uh, uh, productive uh, technological asymmetries, but the monetary and financial asymmetries has a, a greater importance. So this is one uh, important specificity of the current uh, system that explain the predominance of financial shocks uh, as the cause of uh, the external crisis. Uh, <laughs> uh, only two. And uh, a third uh, asym asymmetry that I call macroeconomic asymmetry uh, is a consequence of the interplay uh, between the monetary and financial asymmetries. So, uh, exactly because of that, uh, here I will use a, a, a term of Eleni Ray, the, the dilemma, uh, that b because of this macroeconomic asymmetry, the even the central, but mainly the peripheral uh, economies face a dilemma. What this means? That uh, even with a flexible exchange rate, uh, they don't have a ma macroeconomic policy autonomy or policy space. So in this system, the key currency, the issuer of the key currency at the top of hierarchy has the higher uh, degree of macroeconomic autonomy, and even uh, central uh, countries don't have uh, a degree, so, uh, so a so high degree, they also face uh, uh, dilemmas in, uh, uh, in their uh, economic policies, but here also we have this asymmetry uh, between central and peripheral. So the, uh, the lowest the, the country at the, the currency hierarchy, the lowest, lowest is the, uh, the degree uh, it degree of policy uh, space. And because of that, uh, this currency, these countries couldn't adopt, and is, uh, if you see the, uh, the actual uh, exchange rate regime, uh, there is a dirty floating regime. So this country couldn't adopt a free floating exactly because they need to curb the exchange rate volatility, the higher exchange rate volatility related with the monetary and financial asymmetries. And also, uh, many times, uh, they need to uh, increase their uh, interest rate uh, to uh, attract capital flows and to the finance of the balance of payment. So. Uh, is what we, we call the extra external constraint. So this is also a cause of the lowest degree of uh, macroeconomic policy uh, autonomy. Uh, then, uh, now to uh, talk about uh, the perspectives of the, the system here, I'm using a, a term of uh, Ricardo Parboni, I don't know if you heard about him, was an Italian uh, economists that uh, in 2000, uh, in 1979, uh, published a book called The Dollar and Its Rivals. It's a fantastic book that already uh, highlighted the exorbitant privilege uh, associated with the fiduciary dollar. But unfortunately, Parboni uh, uh, um, uh, how you say, passed away uh, very young, <laughs> um, but at that time, they were the rivals of the dollar uh, were the Japanese yen and the Deutsche Mark. So now uh, we need to we need to talk about the the, the rivals uh, nowadays are the euro and the uh, renminbi. Uh, but before uh, talk about the euro and the renminbi, I would like to detail more. Uh, what um, I, I, I use a, a concept of Benjamin Cohen, the monetary power of the United States. So I would like to, to detail uh, this uh, monetary power to think about uh, perspectives. Um, but uh, to uh, present the, the current views, the, the current views on what will happen, the future of the international monetary uh, and financial system. 
Uh, some authors uh, still um, uh, supporting that the, the word uh, will continue to be a word of a key currency. But here we have also two different uh, positions. Uh, the first one is that US dollar will keep its role of key currency for a long time. <laughs> we could know how long, that, given the uncertainty, but uh, an example is uh, Benjamin Cohen. And I, I share uh, his uh, perspective, but I will explain why. Uh, the second uh, group of authors um, support that the renminbi, uh, that the Chinese one, will become the, the key currency in the medium term. Uh, so, uh, like Subramanian and other uh, authors. And the other view is that we will have in the future a world of multi-currencies. So uh, one example is the last book of uh, Eichengreen uh, that support that the US dollar will have uh, rival sooner than the latter, the later, uh, and because the technological advancements in the currency market, so because of that, uh, currently it's very easy to change uh, uh, currencies, and uh, because of that, the so-called net network externalities uh, was not so important as, as before. Um, and uh, only uh, to mention, there's some authors like the last book of Ag Aglieta that is more normative. That uh, a, a multi-currency world, uh, the, the, future, the international monetary system should be a multi-currency world because a multi-currency would be less unstable, less volatile than a, a, a world uh, with a key currency as the US dollar. Uh, but uh, why I, I share uh, the first uh, view, the, the view of Benjamin Cohen, is what I would like to uh, present now. Uh, here I think it uh, is important uh, to uh, use a concept of uh, Benjamin Cohen, of uh, the concept of monetary power. I think that is useful for us to, uh, to think about perspectives. What is the, um, the monetary power is the, um, the ability uh, to avoid the cost uh, of external adjustment. Uh, so is, uh, the uh, monetary power is linked with uh, what I call the macroeconomic asymmetry. But uh, what is in interesting, uh, the monetary power uh, has two dimensions. The first one is autonomy, is the, the concept we use in, in economics. Uh, that refers to the capacity to delay the external adjustment. So it's a power to. But the second dimension that uh, is autonomy is a precondition uh, uh, to the second dimension, that is the influence. So what is the influence? Is the capacity to deflect adjustment. So it's the power over. And one very, uh, the most, uh, I think, important example is uh, the capacity of the United States to deflect the adjustment to ja Japan uh, during the 80s with the uh, Plaza and the Louvre Agreement. So this is an important uh, example of this capacity of influence. So the issuer of the, the key currency has uh, both autonomy and influence. Uh, but we need so to understand the pillars of the United States monetary power, and uh, in this case also the literature of international uh, political economy uh, is very useful. So. And in this literature, there, there are not a consensus of uh, what determines the key currency. Now, so why the US dollar is the key currency? I share the view of uh, Susan Strange and uh, Heilener uh, that the 
state powers relation is uh, the main cause of the asymmetric use of uh, national currencies at the international level. The other vision that uh, curiously <laughs> is a uh, vision of Benjamin Cohen uh, is that is the, 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 the market that define uh, the uh, key currency and the use, the international use of the money. So uh, we have also this uh, interplay uh, between market and the states, but the, the thing is uh, the w which are more important. So this is the, the controversy. Uh, but we, we have uh, two kinds of uh, state power. The relational power that uh, is a direct power né, of one country regarding another country, but also uh, a structural power. This uh, concept was original proposed by Susan Strange uh, in a book of 1988. And uh, the structural power have four dimensions, uh, uh, the security, knowledge, productive, uh, we could add here, net productive, technological, and the structural power in finance. And um, what, uh, uh, now according to this uh, perspective, the uh, United States structural power uh, is underlying the role of the dollar air as key currency that result in a monetary power, but the monetary power also uh, reinforce the structural power. So we have these uh, feedback loops uh, between the structural power and the monetary power. Uh, and so it's one cause that because uh, the, uh, the inertia of the system, uh, of uh, the, the role of the dollar. Uh, but what this uh, literature um, uh, doesn't uh, emphasize or, or detail, that uh, we have, um, uh, firstly, uh, the cause of, uh, uh, of this structural power, how this structural power emerged after the collapse of uh, Bretton Woods. So uh, here, many uh, other authors uh, emphasize, like Gowan, Hudson, uh, even Dominique Levy, uh, that the United States changed uh, the former order that uh, sustained the role of the U.S., the convert convertible US dollar in Bretton Woods to sustain uh, its hegemony. So uh, the United States changed the structure of the international economy. So uh, this is the orange of the structural uh, power. So the, the main pillar uh, of the fiduciary uh, dollar, flexible dollar, are uh, the, or we could call financial hegemony or the structural power in financing. Uh, then uh, we need to, uh, uh, to emphasize the hierarchy uh, among the dimensions of the structural power. So the main dimension of the structural power of United States in the current system is the structural power in finance that uh, is uh, anchored in the deep the liquid of uh, both the offshore and onshore uh, market, uh, fi financial markets, the importance of US financial institutions and the role of the US treasury bonds as the safe haven of the global wealth. Then, uh, this is uh, my, <laughs> my perspectives, and we could discuss uh, um, uh, after. Um, there also a hierarchy um, uh, between the structural power dimensions and the currency roles. So it's not all the currency roles that has the, the same importance. So I, I, I think we need to, to, to differentiate. Uh, uh, the, there are some currency roles that um, are more important than others, and so is there is linked with these dimensions of the monetary power. Uh, will be be clear wha wha what I mean. Um, so, and the, each currency role also has different impact on the monetary power. Uh, but to understand this. 
uh, this level of uh, analysis, uh, I will, I think <laughs> uh, that we, we need to uh, use the post keynesian approach on money and not, uh, as Benjamin Cohen, the conventional approach on money. Because uh, Cohen um, highlighted uh, this um, uh, difference, uh, importance of the currency roles, but using a conventional uh, approach of money, uh, according to which the market precedes money, and uh, so the, the main function of money is the function, the original function, is the function of medium of exchange. And, uh, but if we use the post keynesian approach of money, uh, according to which the primar primary function of money is the function of money of account, uh, we have other uh, uh, ca uh, causality relation that, so firstly, we need a unit of account to have a monetary economy. And uh, in a monetary economy, we need né, money is also demand as a story of value. Why uh, this is important? Because we need to use the same approach to ana analyze the role of a currency in the international monetary financial system. Uh, but we don't have a state, a, a, a sovereign state in, the, in this case of the international e economy. So the, the key currency is the state of the hegemonic uh, power. And this, uh, this money né, will perform the role of unit of account and also the other functions of money. Um, and underline the, this con what is underlying the acceptability of money of the né, key currency in the international level, exactly the structural power of the United uh, States. So from this perspective, uh, what is a key function of the dollar in uh, the current system? Uh, the function of currency of denomination of the global financial wealth in both the spot and derivative markets. Uh, the role of store of value, uh, and in this case, this role is fulfilled by the West uh, Treasury bonds, and also, uh, already highlighted by the literature, the uh, function of funding and investment currency. So, uh, we need also to include more uh, uh, functions in this original uh, classification of currency of Benjamin Curran, uh, including uh, this, uh, the function of denomination of global wealth, financial wealth and the U.S. Treasury bonds as safe haven. And uh, so in this case, we have also these uh, uh, feedback loops. So the structural power in finance uh, resulting in these key roles, né, is the most important ro roles of the U.S. dollar as key currency, and these roles Re reinforce the structural power in finance. So we need to use uh, this, I, I will use this idea to end with, <laughs> I'm finishing, uh, only here uh, to, to show these other uh, indicators of these other functions of uh, the, the, the key currency and the other uh, international currency. So the, the, the function of store of uh, value at uh, the public usage, so that is very important. And in this case, the US dollar also is uh, predominant with more, more, more than 60% of the total uh, foreign exchange reserves. Uh, at the derivative markets is uh, um, really interesting that uh, almost 90% of the operations are denominated in the US dollar and uh, the function of unit of account as funding currencies. That is what uh, I should recall the, the original thing, né? the incapacity of uh, developing countries, emerging market countries to issue uh, that in, in its uh, currencies. So the dollar also predominate. So these are indicators of this structural power in finance. And so uh, to end, <laughs> Uh, think about the rivals. Uh, my main idea is that uh, in this financial-led capitalism, uh, a rival to the dollar, uh, for a currency to, to become a key currency in, in, 
in the place, in replace the dollar, this uh, currency should have the structural power in finance. Uh, but, so let's see, the case of the, the, the euro is more easier to, <laughs> to, just, uh, uh, to understand uh, why. Uh, I think one important question that I don't have time to, um, to detail here uh, is if uh, the, with the launch of the euro, uh, the aim was uh, only uh, autonomy or also influence. So, uh, from my point of view, uh, they are on only searching for autonomy. Uh, but we have some uh, uh, negative uh, factors uh, behind uh, the possibility of the euro uh, uh, be uh, to become a, a, a key currency that is highlighted by many scholars, uh, the inertia, the problem of the security, the security dimension, uh, that is also uh, very important, uh, and the proactive role. So most part of the literature highlights that the European authorities uh, don't, uh, don't have uh, a proactive role in promoting the euro as a, a, a key currency. And, but the major problem, I think, is uh, that was brought to light by the crisis is that the euro is a, a currency without a state. And so we don't have a uh, uh, treasure behind the, ce the central bank and uh, a market of euro treasure bonds that is key for uh, in this system. Um, but the renminbi, the renminbi, uh, this is an interesting indicator, is a, the renminbi index internationalization. And uh, if we, we look at this figure, wha what happened? We, we see a very important increase from 2012 to uh, 2060, but before that, a stagnation. So, uh, I think that this increase was one of the reasons of this uh, optimism regarding the renminbi, but after that we, we see this uh, stagnation. Uh, and ah, only other thing, Hong Kong is the pre predominant uh, offshore market in renminbi. Uh, why this importance of offshore marketing? Uh, is uh, uh, related with the strategy of the Chinese govern government to promote the international role of the renminbi. So, uh, is uh, now is a consensus that the, the Chinese uh, authorities are uh, uh, aim to promote the role of the renminbi as international currency. So they have a proactive policy to promote this major role, uh, but they have some advantage. China has some uh, advantage uh, as the economic size and the role of uh, global major global exporter, but these uh, roles uh, is, are important to the functions of money as means of time, payment, a unit of account at the trade, trade transactions, but uh, not financial transactions. Uh, in the case of the financial dimension, they are uh, promoting the role of the renminbi as investment and funding currency via the offshore markets, but also central bank swaps lines and increasing the financial openness of the, uh, gradually of the financial of the China's economy. Uh, but we have also many negative uh, factors. Uh, the inertia, uh, some scholars highlight the political system, so the, the, the former uh, and the current uh, 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 country, sure, of the key currency are political democracy, so our discussion about about that, the security dimension, but the, for me, the, uh, the huge, the most important shock to come in, uh, is exactly in the financial dom di dimension. So the a, an existence of liquid and deep uh, uh, onshore private financial markets and a treasure bonds market, that this would uh, require a financial openness and the regulation of Chinese uh, uh, financial market. Uh, then uh, for the renminbi to become a key currency uh, or China changes its development model 
né? or a new phase of capitalism uh, would, will, would emerge compatible with such model. Uh, then, uh, only to end, some final remarks. Uh, I, I put here a statement um, of uh, this, I don't know how to pronounce it, Jair Gilistra is uh, the Central B Bank of Netherlands president at the end of the 70s. Uh, that said, uh, when the pound was gone, where were we, we were able to go for the dollar. If the dollar is gone, where will we go? To the moon for white currency? So I, th I think this statement is still valid uh, uh, currently. Uh, now why? Only to summarize the, the main arguments, uh, exactly because the U.S. monetary power that is underlying the role of the U.S. dollar as the currency of the domination of the global wealth, at fund the, the main funded currency, and uh, the U.S. treasury bonds at safe haven. Uh, and so I already mentioned that the, this structural power of finance is crucial uh, to a uh, currency to become the key currency in this uh, financial-led capitalism. Uh, and unfortunately, Keynes' uh, plan, Keynes' idea of an international unit of account, that it was the, the banker was that only a unit of account, and the symmetrical adjustment uh, of balance of, uh, 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 of payment. So this is the inexistence of, uh, of a country with a monetary power uh, is still a topic. And I think that uh, we have an ag agenda of research uh, to, uh, to linking the, the post keynesian approach of money with the international political economy. I think that for you students, are a fruitful theoretical perspective to think about the international monetary financial system. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Daniela, very much. I think it was very interesting how you relate all this approach on international economics from a post keynesian point of view and also how you explore developing countries and their their position in this system so uh, i think we can open for questions now uh, if there's anybody in the audience otherwise uh, i can also pose a question now well then i'll start um i'll just wait for do you want to pen? Okay. okay, perfect. Thank you, Daniela, for your excellent presentation. Uh, 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 maybe a brief comment I, I on the, only on the, maybe on this, we, uh, I think we all agree on this, at least a medium term perspective, the United States has its dominant power, but on the long term, it could be more, a little bit more doubtful. And uh, uh, you, you underlined quite well the, the, the shortcomings of the euro and the renminbi. Uh, to uh, become the, the, the dominant currency. Uh, maybe uh, the, the euro is starting to change a little bit this, uh, because even if the European Central Bank says it's don't target exchange rates, but still that this, uh, this June in Sintra, they were discussing as the, the, the euro became, came, uh, did 20 year, years, they are, uh, they are they're still uh, start, starting to hear some voices claiming for a more active role of the euro as uh, a, a, an international uh, reserve currency, so that could some that could have some political support, and it, 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 uh, this role could change, at, at, uh, at still at a slow pace. And but uh, I would say also not not to self challenge the dollar, but how the international monetary system works, since we have seen. Well, this uh, Libra Facebook currency that was announced, it's suddenly it, 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 uh, it uh, attracted attention, but also reaction because it would be uh, digital, universal, and that it would raise several uh, uh, money laundering, financial stability concerns. Everyone reacted against it, but uh, uh, against this reaction, several other central banks, other uh, institutions are currently discussing how they could uh, move forward their plans of di digitalization of currencies. And that could, uh, at, at some point, 
uh, uh, I don't know, I want to not say threaten, but uh, uh, to, to change the game of power within the, the international monetary system. And, and, and then I would like to hear your comments on that. Thank you. Daniela, do you want to answer to that one first, or do you prefer to collect? Okay, let's just collect. Let's just collect a couple more. Uh, Robert, is there any student who wants to make a question? Okay, you go over there, Robert, and then with you. Please briefly introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Laura. I'm studying um, the EPOC program in the first year in Berlin now. I have a question concerning your um, take on the structural. Like, I had the feeling that you base the, the financial power, the structural financial power of the dollar in the structural power of the US. And it's a I had the feeling that it's a power analysis that is really focused on, on states and on the, on the relations between them. I wonder um, did, whether this did not really, like whether we also have to kind of see that um, uh, there are different actors now that kind of um, transport and um, further this power when we see like these multinational corporations that kind of um, also cause financial elites to, to establish in peripheral countries. Um, so I wonder whether this, this focus on, on, on the state is, is actually still appropriate and what's your opinion on that? Thank you. Okay, cool. So Daniela, do you wanna take those two questions? Thank you for the questions. I think th this issue is really very, uh, how you say, controversial, and uh, we have many uncertainties because, sure, we couldn't know what will happen <laughs> in the merge on, uh, long term. Uh, so I think that is very di difficult to to think about how long. Uh, so this scenario. Uh, my scenario, how long uh, I'm thinking, uh, and the, uh, how many years, I don't know. Uh, it's very difficult to, um, to define this. Uh, I, I'm really pessimist uh, regarding the, the euro. Um, I think it is mo most, most uh, probably uh, the, the euro sustain his important role as the second uh, international uh, currency. So, uh, uh, as we see, we have a 30% uh, more or less in this uh, means of payment, uh, private usage, and even it decreased since the crisis is a very important uh, share. And we could have an incre uh, increased role of renminbi, so more like a multi-currency uh, uh, world. I think that this is possible uh, as like three monetary blocks. Uh, uh, but I think that it's really difficult to think in the medium term of the uh, uh, the dollar as lost be replaced at, as a key currency uh, because um, uh, the, the reasons I, I, I mentioned uh, and regarding the the libra <laughs> it's really this last week uh, was launched I think this is other very interesting and important subject, the cryptocurrencies. Uh, and uh, we know that the Bitcoin, the other ones, they are uh, actually financial assets. Uh, they are not currency uh, from our, not from the post perspective. But the, the, the Libra, as I, what I, I, I read, I got to know that the aim is a more stable uh, reserve of value. But this is really, and uh, we need to think about, né, from our perspective, a, a currency without state, and uh, a currency of financial private uh, companies. Uh, uh, but I think also that is really, I s for me, I don't know, 
<laughs> it's difficult to think about a libra as a so replace the dollar or something like that. Uh, but is I we will see uh, in the future. Um, but I agree with you that the mm, uh, the uh, institutional framework of the euro uh, area has uh, improved after uh, the crisis. Uh, so as uh, I, I like very much the, the concept of design faults of uh, Areshi and the Professor Sa Sawyer, uh, that so, so some design faults has been uh, not more, more fixed, but we still have, I think, uh, problems uh, in regarding this uh, institutional preconditions for uh, the replacement of the dollar. So it's only uh, and regarding uh, your comment, uh, uh, I agree with you. I, I didn't. I focus on the structural power of the United States, but uh, as we see, the United the structural power finance and this structural power, as I mentioned, uh, is linked with uh, the uh, United States financial institutions. But I agree with you, we should even add, even uh, in finance, the, the role of transnational corporations, but th because transnational corporations are also uh, uh, finance uh, uh, agents that has huge uh, uh, financial applications uh, due to the financialization, the so-called financialization. So the, I think that the, the structural power of the US, even the technological, uh, uh, dimension and security dimension uh, are linked with uh, both uh, the financial institutions and the transnational corporations. So I, I agree with you, we have this, uh, the second dimension uh, that I, I put, the power uh, uh, relation between state and markets. So this is key to understand the dynamics of financial aid capitalism. It's only a uh, uh, question that uh, to focus on this, uh, to think about the rivals and the potential rivals. And I, I focus on the structural power, but uh, our finance, or the, 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 the side of the state, but we have also this interaction, uh, the state and private uh, agents and private institutions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so next round of questions. We already have Robert and João Pedro. Very good, Joel. So we'll do those three. Jay Christopher, we can do that in the next round. Uh, well, very much thank you for your delivery. I followed your work for 20 years, and I think you're the one of the most complete analysts of international monetary system. Uh, you started. You started your delivery by saying that the current international monetary financial system is embedded as a phase of finance-led capitalism, right? And then uh, you kind of develop the different elements, but you kind of didn't go back to the phase, but basically saying it's inert, it's inert, right? But to me, the international monetary system has been changing throughout history, and uh, it's a slow process. It is inert for many good reasons, not least for the international liquidity preference reason and there's always a drive for one single currency or one single form of money. But it, it's also true that when you take a long wave approach, uh, you see that the international monetary system follows certain long waves, right? And uh, so you had the classic uh, gold standard in the late 19th century, which disintegrated, and then we got into the crisis, which Great Depression and the war. And then you have Bretton Woods, and then it falls apart. You have a stagflation crisis. You get out of this with a different kind of dollar standard. That's the Kingston system. And now we are in the middle of a downswing phase. And it's important to realize that in that system, there is already a lot of tensions that will explode, right? So because also in that, in that pattern of long waves with international monetary system, you see that there's a pattern of two crises, not one, but two. And it's the second crisis that reorganizes the system, right? Uh, and so we are moving into that second crisis, right? And uh, that's my view. Uh, and it, it has to do also with how the international monetary system works because you've had uh, an immediate agreement in 2008, 2009 not to have protectionism, but then you had monetary protectionism, right? 
You get quantitative easing driving down the currency with the dollar, hits the eurozone. The eurozone has quantitative easing, lowers the dollar, which was very bad for me because I was working in Paris at the time and living with New York prices. Uh, and so I know very well what happened. And then this hits the commodity super cycle, Brazil very badly in 2015, China also in 2015. So you have a propagation of the crisis through the international monetary system. And then, of course, it becomes, it goes to trade protectionism. We are now in that phase, right? And, and, in that f and, and so we're moving into this process uh, where we have deglobalization, because in all these downswing phases, you have deglobalization, right? You have bursts of globalization in the upswing phases and deglobalization. And politically, you have this also with nationalistic movements taking power in different countries, including yours. I mean, it was Guido Manchega who said currency wars. Now you have Jair Bolsonaro, right? Uh, and, and, but these are not innocent patterns, right? There's a pattern. And the important thing is that the, the, the second crisis takes very strange forms, typically World War I, World War II, but it may be the climate change crisis. And then you have to have a new regime. And then you have a new regime with a new international monetary system. And in that system, the SDRs may be important, right? You didn't talk about it at all. You didn't talk about special drawing rights and how they can fairly easily be upgraded to something else. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Daniela, for the presentation. I'm Jean Pedro from the cohort of 2017. I follow your work very closely, and I really like it. And I always learn something new when I see one of your presentations. But I have a question, and it may, it may dialogue with the question of Robert. It might be a bit provocative, perhaps. But it's, it's something that I have been thinking lately, and that I see and agree with you with all of the structural power and the asymmetries of the international monetary and financial system, all of the macroeconomic power of the US, given its hegemonic role. But also in this system, there is some side sort of contradictions in the sense that some on the distinction between the peripheral markets, the peripheral countries, some of them were more vulnerable, but some of them are capable of, say, surfing on these asymmetries and using uh, some sort of uh, exchange rate policies and other type, types of policies and to make profit out of this position of the United States as very huge and large current account deficit that was allowing these countries to, to grow and to develop sustain and persistent current account surpluses for years that allowed them to more or less avoid the external constraint when on the on the low phases of the cycle and allow them like a long run development pattern. So it was not only something that was in uh, little waves, but they allowed them for 30 years, for instance, on China, but also other countries. So that's it maybe connects because I would like to, to know your opinion, how to, to connect this. And this is a lot of uh, research is showing empirical evidence that some sort of stable exchange rate and competitive some sort of current account surpluses in the long run. They are related to higher investment and related to technological change. So how to feed these type of strategies and that allows a lot of emerging markets, not a lot, but some of them, <laughs> some quite important, yeah. Uh, okay, not a, to, to develop and to do into a system in the, in the form of the Keynes system where you have to punish current account surpluses on a wood be in emerging markets if they are doing this strategy in a some persistent way. Hi, and uh, thanks for the presentation. My name is Joel. I'm from the core 2016. And it's a, a, a very simple question, mine. So for developing countries uh, in this uh, system that you uh, clearly illustrate, would, what will be the type of capital controls you would advocate for in order to protect themselves from all these uh, things you described? I'm Jay Christopher, also from the 2016 cohort. Um, so, it, 
it seems like the, the idea is that uh, the U.S. dollar's position comes partly from the power of the U.S. financial system, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so my question would be, for people on the left in the U.S. who want to dramatically reduce the power of the U.S. financial system, is that something that we should worry about, where maybe eight years of Bernie Sanders breaking up banks and running around and throwing people in jail, that you could actually decrease that power so much that we could actually, in the next 20 to 30 years, be looking at multi-currency world. Um, and so I guess part one is, is that feasible or is the system just so big that even if we take a sledgehammer to it, it's still the biggest and best thing around? And then I guess stage two would be, if we could break it up and like make it less powerful, would that be worth it from a very like US-centric perspective? Would that be worth it to not have finance overlording over us even if we lose the, the dollar status? Daniela, do you want to answer those four questions? Like this, okay, you are listening. Um, then thank Robert for your comments. Um, you know, I, I know your view, not so detailed as you updated. Um, and so I, I focus here uh, on, it's nice to, to, to discuss, uh, I know. Um, and uh, also to select the uh, issues and, uh, but um, my point is, yes, we have these long waves and uh, um, the financial, uh, the global financial crisis, this is an um, important thing, I, I don't have time to include uh, th there are some uh, discussions, some authors that uh, has been saying and that the U.S. Uh, what monetary power, uh, the, the role of the dollar uh, as key currency, and the, the U.S. power has uh, in, in have increased uh, after the global financial crisis, uh, even with these uh, central bank dollar swaps. Uh, so I think this is a very important discussion uh, um, if the, the US United States power uh, in finance or structural power has increased uh, after or decreased uh, as I understood your point of view that uh, has been decreasing uh, but is every for coincident I, I was in a bo board of a PhD thesis at UFRJ um, Alexis was there uh, with this uh, position that has increased, and I, I, w I think uh, very interesting. Um, but and, and I thought uh, if I include here or not, but uh, it's not uh, time. But I, I, I think about this uh, uh, structural crisis that the, the global financial crisis was not the structural crisis of the financial led capital. I think that this could happen. I agree with you that many changes in the political side and the economic side, uh, climate change, I, I think it, it's possible. But for me, it's still I, difficult to think about the SDR, is why I, I still think that is uh, utopical. Even if I, I think it will be a good, nice solution, um, my point is the uh, the f feasibility of this happen uh, in political terms. So th this is um, why for me, is, uh, like, it's not the, the Keynes plan, but the, it's the idea of the uh, unit, international unit of account. And uh, exactly because these power relations um, that I think that maybe is still uh, utopic. But uh, it's, uh, uh, it's very difficult to, to know what, what will happen. I, I agree with you, many changes, and uh, even this protectionism, uh, Trump po politics. Um, so I think it's a, a possible scenario. I think that we are discussing here possible scenarios. And uh, the, it's difficult that to, to, put, uh, to define the probabilities. Uh, but okay, I, I, I 
I think that is an um, important point that, that you made and we need to consider uh, in our, uh, in think about perspectives. Um, but think this is, a, I think, the medium term, short term, medium term, and long term uh, that, that scenarios uh, that is, is difficult to, to define, um, uh, to, to think about more medium term, long term perspectives. Um, um, João, João uh, then in this presentation, because of the, the, the subject, I, I, uh, my option uh, was not to detail the peripheral economies, emerging market economies strategies. Uh, that is, is, as you know, is one of my, my research uh, subjects. Uh, but I, I think that we have options. I, I don't think that um, uh, we are taught uh, completely vulnerab vulnerable and we, we could um, adopt many uh, tools to protect it. Uh, emerging market economies could uh, adopt uh, tools, uh, policies to protect themselves from, from the, the shocks and all the uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, then I think it's important to study uh, uh, cases, uh, to, to case studies uh, is, uh, to understand uh, uh, and to um, see how, which kind of policies and instruments that could uh, help to increase the degree of macroeconomic policy autonomy. So uh, this perspective of the currency hierarchy, uh, our, uh, our, um, that from this perspective, don't, don't means that, uh, it, it doesn't mean that the emerging market economy don't, don't have, economies don't have uh, uh, possibilities to ad, uh, increase the, the, the macroeconomic policy autonomy. But if they are totally, uh, uh, totally the degree of financial openness, uh, this is uh, the, uh, the starting point. In this case, we have the lowest degree of uh, macroeconomic policy autonomy. So how to increase these degrees, this degree? Uh, I think that capital controls uh, are essential, uh, key for, for uh, the emerging market economies increase the policy space. Uh, in the case of Brazil and other uh, emerging market economies that has huge derivatives uh, for exchange markets, and the case of Brazil is very clear about that, uh, capital controls and prudential financial regulations are not sufficient. So we need also, uh, in face of the importance of derivative markets, of foreign exchange derivative markets, uh, we need in st some countries to adopt it. Uh, also uh, what I call uh, derivative uh, uh, re regulation, foreign exchange derivative regulation. And, um, the case of Brazil is very interesting. Dur during the Dilma government, uh, during the huge, the, the boom flow, capital uh, boom, uh, the boom of capital flows after the crisis, uh, Brazil adopted a huge uh, toolkit of uh, capital flow foreign exchange derivative uh, regulations. And uh, uh, we could, in this period, uh, we could even reduce our very high exchange, uh, interest rate. So, um, I think that we have uh, experience showing that it's possible, but this depends on the political relations. Uh, the problem is the, the, um, the, po po the uh, power relations inside in each country. Uh, so uh, as you know, we, we could think about the economic policies and what would be the normative dimension uh, but also the case of Brazil shows that many, many cases, what happened? Uh, because, from my point of view, exactly because uh, Dilma government faced financial markets, faced the financial power of uh, Brazilian banks, that this result is one cause, for, from my point of view, of the failure of PT strategy and of Bolsonaro. Uh, so, is it, it, very <laughs> complicated in some cases, uh, but I agree with you that 
Écoutez, voilà. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Ah, et donc, bienvenue pour cette table ronde sur, à propos de, des sciences What? sociales et, et des gilets jaunes. Euh, on va pas en, en une heure et demie. Euh, I want to say Your voice has changed. <laughs> yes. So that's it. Uh, you speak perfect French too. <laughs> yeah. There is another amphitheater. Okay, you just speak loud now. Yeah, I'm not finished. Yeah, you finish ah, yes, without the microphone. Otherwise, no, yes. Uh, but I would only like to add one thing. <laughs> that uh, if, if from the perspective of uh, there is hierarchy, um, what would be important for a, a energy market economy? To, to uh, don't have huge uh, current account deficits. Uh, so in this case, uh, one important precondition, it's not the only one, is a competitive exchange rate. So in two, in two have the capacity that for the central bank to have the capacity to intervene uh, in the pro exchange market and the intervention have, uh, to be effective uh, to sustain a level of the exchange rate, uh, this would be also uh, useful uh, or even necessary to decrease the degree of financial openness we capital account regulations and foreign exchange derivative market regulations. So I, I don't know if I think about Asian economies. Uh, so in, in this case, I think that it's important to, uh, the degree of financial openness is very important also to increase the, not only the autonomy, but I think we need to distinguish autonomy and effectiveness. Because in the mainstream economies, they, they are, uh, <coughs> Uh, um, they are the same. When, when they are talking about autonomy, they are talking about effectiveness. But in some case, we could have autonomy, but the, your policy could be not effective. Um, but I think it's uh, important to, to make these case studies and to understand more how to improve our uh, institutional framework and, and policy regime. I think I think that you could talk more. Uh, so uh, capital controls, I, I totally agree. And, uh, but it's interesting, when I was preparing the, the presentation, I, I think about that, how this issue, that was a, a huge a discussion, even uh, the IMF that has changed um, its vision on capital controls uh, during the boom in 2010, but uh, since 2000, when Bernanke said that uh, the Fed will uh, withdraw, uh, withdraw the quantitative easing, that the, the capital flows uh, has had the burst of capital flows. Since that, we, we don't uh, hear uh, anymore about capital controls. Uh, the, the subject has uh, disappeared, I think, and uh, it's important to, to return to, to this discussion. Um, uh, your your point. Uh, yes, maybe uh, uh, I think is again this question of politi political and economy. Uh, so if we have a, a, the, a different government uh, in the West, as the studio could happen, the, the, the development model could change. Uh, so I think that. Our difficulty is exactly to uh, think about the future, exactly to combine, right, to think about this interaction between the economic dimension and the political dimension. Uh, you know that politics is, is key uh, uh, to, to think about what uh, will happen. Uh, but I, I think that the, the debate uh, currently in the US is, is very interesting, the economic debate. And uh, in Brazil, it is really sad because the, the, the dominance of the, the liberal, neoliberal and the orthodox thinking uh, is really uh, terrible. 
and uh, as I, I could, no, I, I, I could read in the West, even Europe is much more uh, interesting and uh, so. Okay. So we have time for one more round of questions. So please, okay, so speak out loud. We have no mic. First, read over there. Okay, so my name is Ruiz, and thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. Just uh, concerning the role of the euro that we're very pessimistic to prepare, I, I mean, I've always been amazed at how uh, the, I mean, the city of London has managed to remain a key financial center, some kind of hub that works for the entire economy, for the entire world economy. And maybe I'm not so updated on the subject because my figures are Adam Tuzes and it goes back to the pre-crisis period. But you had this synergy between the American and the British financial systems. And I, so do you have some insights on whether it's still the case? But to the best of my understanding, it's somehow still the case. And so the next question is, what about Brexit? What about if Britain suddenly uh, sorry, uh, loses this very strong role within the, entire, the worldwide financial system? And if all this is displaced to Frankfurt, Paris, or Amsterdam, how do you see the role of the euro in this potential recomposition? Um, some kind of visible transatlantic thing facing the Renmin, for example. Daniel, thank you for your, your lecture. It's truly encompassing of, of so many issues. Um, Sunanda Sen from India, one of our colleagues in international monetary, uh, was in touch uh, last night, and she was talking about a, a paper by Yan Liang uh, about modern monetary theory and the developing economies. Oh, okay. Now, uh, and we heard Mark Lavoie mention about that this morning. Just uh, curiosity, we, we, there are so many heavy questions on the, in the air, but have you thought at all about modern monetary theory in the context of this theory? And if not, I, I know I haven't. Uh, is this maybe something we might just consider as a, a topic for further thinking? Thanks, Gary. Uh, last question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a related question to Gary's and also to developing countries' monetary policy autonomy. So at your presentation, you mentioned the dilemma view, the impossible dilemma view, which says that regardless of the exchange rate regime, the uh, developing country doesn't have monetary policy autonomy. And this is an alternative view to the trilemma view with respect to developing countries. But then we also have the compensation view, which says that regardless of the exchange rate regime, a country, at least if it has a surplus, it has monetary policy autonomy because compensation is automatic and it can maintain the exchange rate and have, still have an exogenous interest rate. So my question would be, are these two views, the impossible duality view and the compensation thesis, opposite views? Or can we think in terms of, even if the compensation thesis discusses a more technical aspect, the impossible duality view discusses a more political aspect of those restrictions in developing countries? for questions, really. <laughs> so many things to, to put in the, the puzzle, uh, to set up the puzzle. Uh, no, I, I think it's very important uh, to, to think about the role of London uh, as, as, as financial center. Uh, even I, I remember Highlander has a very uh, important uh, thing uh, in his book on um, the, the, the re-emergence of global finance mm -hmm. of 1994. Uh, what he said that the United Kingdom uh, would like is um, uh, to uh, risk, uh, to, uh, in the beginning of the 60s with the euro market. So there are uh, there no 
action, the no action of the, the, like the government, uh, so to let the euro market uh, emerge and, and develop uh, with the aim of uh, 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 replace, replace no, not, uh, um, to increase the role of London as a financial center. So it is like uh, uh, the, the last, the former hegemony, London, uh, England, as uh, the power of Sterling, and so the importance of this um, no no action uh, was uh, uh, so they strange called the negative political decisions when a uh, state crossed the, uh, its arms, letting the increasing role of, of, of financial markets, the, the, the transactions denominating in dollars. So uh, I think that uh, since uh, this uh, has uh, has begun in the 60s, uh, the euro market, but after the collapse of Bretton Woods, the importance of London uh, has increased uh, even more uh, as the center of the offshore market in dollar. And uh, I agree with you that this link between uh, the, the United States financial system and um, the London um, financial system, the United Kingdom, English financial system, is very important. Uh, and even, uh, I don't know if you know the very interesting paper of uh, volume from this and a co-author. Uh, ah, it's again. <laughs> On the uh, fi uh, global financial crisis, criticizing this, the global saving glut uh, and saying that what was most important previous to the crisis was the, the financial flows uh, from the, uh, Europe uh, to the United States, the private financial flows that was nothing to do about uh, global saving glut and Chinese nah, uh, uh, acquisitions of treasury bonds. Uh, so I, I think that in this um, system, uh, the um, assets around the world, uh, so we are very uh, there are very important uh, links uh, and cross-border uh, um, flows among uh, uh, developed uh, center co uh, countries among the, uh, the advanced uh, countries. So it's as exactly because this, uh, the marginal ins insertion of emerging market economy. So the, the m most important flows uh, né, uh, happen né, uh, between the cross-border assets and liabilities uh, among uh, center uh, economies. So I, I think it's very important uh, point. And uh, uh, regarding the Brexit, uh, it's true. Uh, I I think that what could happen is an increase. Uh, if now I think that will happen the Brexit, unfortunately, and this dislocation of transactions to Paris and Frankfurt. So, in this case, uh, uh, is an important uh, issue that would increase some kind of uh, structural power of, of the euro area in finance. So uh, the, the importance of the uh, liquid and deep financial markets. So I think is another uh, piece <laughs> that we, we should increase in the puzzle uh, to, to think about the perspectives. Uh, think, thank you very much. Um, um, Gary and uh, Lillian, uh, thank you. It's uh, really a, another, uh, you, uh, you know that we, we met in other uh, conference and uh, uh, I've been researching uh, my, one, my, my current research uh, to the Brazilian, uh, we have this, uh, um, the Brazilian uh, Council uh, for ah, the, the name in, in English, uh, the funding agency, the research funding end agency in Brazil, CNPq. So my my current research for the CNPq is exactly on uh, is on monetary sovereignty, uh, currency hierarchy, and uh, policy space. And uh, and that in this uh, lecture here, I, I I I didn't have time to to detail. 
So thank you for for the opportunity. And uh, my, my perspective, uh, uh, I from my perspective is why what I I have I read a paper on, on that uh, is that uh, the monetary mo I I didn't re I haven't read yet this paper. Okay, uh, so. Yes, I, so I, I know I, I need to read, uh, but uh, based on uh, mainly the last books of Ra book of Randall Ray, uh, because even Randall Ray changed uh, his concept of um, monetary sovereignty. Uh, I think that uh, the problem for me of moneter modern monetary theory is that uh, it. Uh, doesn't consider exactly the currency hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think that uh, to uh, think about uh, policy space, macroeconomic policy autonomy of uh, emerging market economies in the current system, uh, we need to consider uh, both the monetary sovereignty and the uh, position of the currency hierarchy. Uh, so this is the first uh, point. Um, and the second point is that uh, the concept of monetary sovereignty proposed by Ray for monet modern monetary theory, uh, I, I, I think for me also uh, has some problems. And uh, uh, what I propose in this paper is exactly a new concept of monetary sovereignty uh, based on the post keynesian theory uh, but not on uh, the uh, modern money theory. Uh, so, but uh, and uh, but this this paper I, I need to uh, to read. Uh, so my my discussion by now is more uh, think about the uh, policy space of the euro currencies and uh, emerging market uh, economies. Uh, uh, and uh, in this uh, relationship between monetary sovereignty and uh, position of the, uh, the currency hierarchy. And uh, answer, uh, answer to you also. Uh, so, for example, what is the policy recommendation of L Randall Ray in his last book? That uh, he is still uh, supporting the trilemma and uh, he says that emerging, uh, he called developing countries, should adopt flexible exchange rate. And this is not possible. We couldn't. Uh, and for me, this is completely contradictory with the post Keynesian approach on exchange rate. Because what, uh, no, mainly John Harvey and even Paul Davis and others, that uh, Oh, even they, they are uh, uh, talking about central currencies and not about emerging uh, market currency. Uh, the volatility of exchange rates, uh, they are high, high vo volatile. So uh, for us, the, the, at the lowest level of the currency hierarchy, we need to intervene uh, in the foreign exchange market. Even, for example, the case of Brazil of the inflation targeting, the pass through is so strong, so great, that if we don't uh, curb the volatility, that it's impossible to achieve the inflation target. So uh, even if we don't, uh, the, 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 the policy regime, the macroeconomic policy regime, uh, doesn't care about the level of the exchange rate, no? so a competitive exchange rate, it, we need to intervene. Um, and also the impact of capital flows. Uh, so, but this, um, uh, does it mean that, uh, for example, Brazil, we, uh, we, <laughs> the, the uh, Brazilian Central Bank has a target of interest rate. We fix the interest rate. The interest rate is exogenous. In, uh, but to, we need to consider our lower liquidity premium, the lower liquidity premium of our currency uh, that is like we have a, a spread that we need to add uh, uh, to fix the, the domestic the policy rate. So I think that one thing is the, the theory of exogenous uh, uh, interest rate that nowadays even the mainstream new, new consensus, everyone agree that the target of monetary policy is the, uh, the policy rate. But this uh, 
né, from my point of view, this is not the same of uh, macroeconomic policy autonomy. No? Then from this perspective of the currency hierarchy, why? Because the concept of um, uh, macroeconomic policy autonomy is, uh, we, we find different concepts in the literature. We don't have only one, one concept, co concept. For coincidence, I, I was um, preparing a, a lecture on, on, on macroeconom open macroeconomics and uh, I used the uh, uh, Mark uh, uh, foundations uh, on these. And if we compare the concepts, we, we find the different concepts. So for in our approach of the currency hierarchy, we don't, uh, we emerging market economies don't have macroeconomic policy autonomy in which sense that uh, the constraints we face uh, in the system uh, uh, influence the level of our exchange rate. We, we Brazil, sure, if a country has surplus in the current account, this increases the, the policy space. So we need to uh, analyze uh, how to increase the policy space. Uh, um, so this is, I think, is, is one important thing, is, is this uh, necessity of include uh, the, this lowest uh, spread that uh, uh, corresponds to, that will um, uh, correspond to this uh, lowest liquid premium in our uh, policy rate. Okay, so, uh, but, the uh, compensation um, principle. Uh, I, I don't think it's in, in, in incompatible. Uh, why? Because this again, we need to look at the uh, um, each uh, at countries experiences. Uh, now I, I always uh, stimulate and fostering my students to make country studies. Uh, why? If you look what happened in Brazil, the, the Brazilian Central Bank has problems with repo operations. We need, the only way of uh, sterilize the excess of liquidity in the money market, Brazil, who has a, a excess of liquidity, that is sterilized with repo operations. Okay, and given the high level of our exchange rate uh, of interest rate, has impact on the public debt and the public debt that is an indicator, a conventional indicator uh, uh, used by the so-called market, financial market. And so and this has impact on our policy space, on the fiscal policy space. Um, so I think that depending, we need to look at the, the tool used by the central bank uh, in the sterilization operations. Uh, on, so for one example, in the case of Mexico, Mexico, Me Mexico used a long-term sterilization tool uh, to neutralize the impact of foreign exchange operations. So this kind of uh, sterilization tool uh, increased the uh, policy space of the, me uh, the Mexican Central Bank regarding to the Brazilian Central Bank. So I think that uh, this, we need to look at the institutional specificity also to, to think about the degree of policy autonomy and compensation. Uh. Uh, thank you very much, Daniela.